that didn't work out. But to see Alonzo, one of the greatest drivers on the planet, uh, um, back in uh, in an Indy car for the Indy 500, that is massive. We'll talk a whole lot more about that as we get close to the Indy 500. That was some major, major news. So we are, uh, yeah, we're going to take a short break. We come back. It is Kyle Bush right here on the show, here on the General Tire Down and Dirty Show, powered by Polaris Razor. Your life demands a tire that provides durability, comfort, and performance, and that's what General Tire delivers for you. From the all-season grip of the Grabber UHP to the comfort and on-road manners of the Grabber HTS to the durability and off-road traction of the Grabber AT2, General has a tire that will help get you where you need to go. So let us take you on your next big adventure. Tweet us at General Tire, hashtag anywhere is possible, because with General Tire, anywhere is possible. Don't just shred your way through any off-road rugged terrain. Get into gear with GSP XTV and let us redefine your adventure. The GSP advantage of quality and performance sets a standard for UTV axles. We strive to provide premium ATV and UTV axles to keep you shreddy ready. Kick up some dirt and get in the driver's seat with GSP XTV. With over 35 years of experience, drive with a company you can trust. Drive with GSP. For more information, please visit us at gspxtv.com today. You're listening to the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. All killer and no filler. Welcome back to the General Tire Down and Dirty Show, powered by Polaris Razor. I'd like to welcome my next guest, uh, Kyle Bush, to the line. Kyle, man, how is, uh, how's everything going? Uh, it's going okay, I guess. You know, we've certainly uh, we've had our ups and downs already so far this year, but uh, looking forward to plenty more wins, hopefully. Yeah. How how is it when you uh, go to a track like Vegas? I mean, that's kind of your hometown. I mean, I remember as a kid, I can't say a kid because we're about the same age, but I remember you wa- running dirt tracks in the Southwest. I remember watching you at like Mojave Valley out there by Needles. Like, how is it going back to the Southwest and being in the Vegas area? It's good. I enjoy it. You know, the, the West Coast and being able to go back to Vegas, California, Phoenix, it's kind of homes away from home, I guess, nowadays, you know, being everything's out on the east coast in north carolina but um i enjoy it i like it you know vegas though it's everybody's like oh how's it like going home and being in front of the hometown crowd and all that sort of stuff i'm like well you know it's kind of a destination race for people they kind of pick vegas as a race that they want to go to that they want to see uh, a nascar race and have some fun in the city so you get a lot of -of out-of-towners there so um of course there's family friends that uh, i guess family is, is not there but there's some friends there that um you know i kind of grew up around and stuff like that that come out and cheer us on so it's always cool yeah i gotta tell you vegas is probably completely different now i mean than when uh you know when you kind of grew up there right i mean it's it's a total different city atmosphere i mean it's just you look at vegas now and 20 years ago there's no comparison yeah i i haven't really been able to spend a whole lot of time out there but every time i go there there's kind of something else that's going on or or uh being built and obviously with um you know, the, the, the hockey team, the Las Vegas Knights that uh, are now there, that was really cool and really special that they made it all the way to the finals in their first year. That was cool to watch. Um, you know, now they got the Raiders kind of going to town. So it's really becoming a sports mecca. And when I was living there growing up there, I was always kind of wondering, you know, like, why don't we have sports teams yeah. here? And my dad was, was always telling me, well, they're just not big enough. Or just don't, you know, there's not the um, the amount of people there that uh, that would support a sports team. And so now I guess that, the city's just grown so much. I mean, it's almost valley to mountain to mountain throughout the valley, and um, they're starting to go up the mountains now. Yeah. So here's a question. Do you, I mean, obviously now, I mean, your your home, your family, your business, everything's in Charlotte. How was that transplant, man? I mean, I got to feel like that's home now, you know, even though, you know, you kind of come back to the West Coast. But how is that being a West Coast kid? Because I'm from the West Coast. You know, how, how was that when you first originally transplanted to the East Coast? It had to have been, had been different, man, because it's, it's, everything is different on the East Coast. It was definitely different, for sure. You know, when you were done racing and in uh in vegas late at night and you're on your way home and about everything's still open you know you could stop in the the, the grocery store the drug store you could go to in and out burger you can find some food places that are open on the way home whatever it needs to be and then when you're out on the east coast you know and sometimes you're out late at night or doing something whatever it might be and uh, you're heading home and it's like everything's closed there's not anything open so um you definitely got to look at what time things are open till versus vegas everything's always open you know so that's definitely a shell shock. But other than that, 
um, living in Vegas, being a part of, um, you know, the town there and never really did a whole lot of stuff down on the strip. So that was always kind of a different, there's, there's a life away from the life, yeah. you know, um, there's a town, there's a community, there's all kinds of stuff that that's within Vegas that isn't necessarily always the strip. So, um, that's kind of how it, it is in North Carolina for me, where, you know, there's always like a downtown, whether you live in Charlotte or Cincinnati or Nashville or something like that. There's, there's always a downtown, but there's still the community outside of that. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of the place you go when you got people in town, you want to show them something, but nobody that actually lives there ever really goes there. Right. Yeah, exactly. That that's true for sure. Yeah. So we got to do, we do have to talk a little bit about Vegas, man. And I guess the big story coming out of Vegas, I don't think was a cup race at all. I think Twitter blew up and, uh, it had to do with uh, with a, with a truck race, man. Uh, talk a little bit about this bounty. I know uh, Kevin Harvick threw some money out there. All of a sudden, uh, you know, I think another fifty grand got popped in there by by Ganderson. All of a sudden, we got a hundred k bounty on your head, man. I mean, kind of take us through this because I know trucks is something you're passionate about. You've got your team there, uh, but but how you feeling about this uh, this this number being put on you? I mean, it is what it is. It's all right. The um you know, being in the truck series and being as good as Kyle Busch Motorsports is, I mean, I've been able to win seven races in a row now, I guess, and should have been more than that. I think the one before the, the one that would have made it eight in a row, I finished second, but we had a bad pit stop and I had to start dead last on the final run. That was only 20 laps wrong and I couldn't make it all the way to the front in time. So, um, you know, I, we just, we can win about any single race out there. And, um, so Kevin Harvick basically said, you know what? all these cup guys that are sitting on their couches and watching me race and saying that I'm cherry picking races and they're not supporting the fact that I'm out there in my own stuff and doing good things for, for the series and for NASCAR. He's like, look, put your money where your mouth is kids. Like get out there and go and try to beat them. Then if you think that it's so easy and um, you know, so Kevin's actually kind of on my side about it, but um, you know, there's some of these other guys that, uh, that just, think I'm cherry picking races, but man, you got to have sponsors to be in this business. And fortunately I've got some good sponsors in the truck series and I've got other good younger drivers that are trying to make it as well too. And, you know, if it wasn't for Kyle Busch Motorsports and my team in the series, there wouldn't be the likes of Eric Jones and Christopher Bell and William Byron and Bubba Wallace and, um, you know, Harrison Burton now in the Xfinity series. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of drive Noah Gragson in the Xfinity series. There's a lot of drivers that have come through our place that, Maybe or maybe not would have come through other people's places, but, um, you know, I, I still take some, some credit in being able to help those guys and get them to the next level. Well, and I think, too, you know, me looking at things, and, I, and honestly, I haven't really studied the, the NASCAR truck, you know, the uh, uh, the TV ratings or anything, but I got to think having you in for, you know, five races or when you had Greg Biffle in the truck last year and he took that victory, I got to think, I mean, this is a big deal. There, there's a whole lot of additional eyeballs on the races then, you know what I mean? And there's got to be a spike in the ratings. I mean, you know, they, they can say whatever they want, but at the end of the day, they got to be pretty happy when you show up to race. Well, I think it. Uh, it can go both ways. You know, you can certainly have your Kyle fans that tune in to show up and watch the race because I'm in it. And then you're going to have your haters that turn the TV off that don't want to watch it because they know I'm going to win. And that just irks them so bad that they can't stand to live with themselves sometimes the next day. So it's, um, you know, it's certainly a unique situation, but uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, I go out there and try to compete and do the best I can with the stuff I got. And fortunately, it's been pretty good lately. We've been able to win some races and, um, you know, our, my other teams, they were competitive this weekend in Vegas. They were running second and third to me for a little bit there. They kind of got uh, crossed up on a restart there and, and dropped back just a little bit and then ended up in some bad traffic situations. So those are young kids trying to learn. We got to talk to them about how to get better in that and, um, you know, get them on to uh, to finishing top fives and getting finishes out of those trucks that we know are good. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the cup race there, too. Cause how do you approach a race like that where all of a sudden, you know, there's weather delays, there's all kinds of stuff, there's whatever the heck, you know, happened with NASCAR, and you think you're starting in the front, all of a sudden you, you're starting in the back, man. How, how, how does that affect the game plan? I mean, I got to think it's really got to kind of throw things out the window, and you know you've got a fast car, and all of a sudden you're going to have to pick your way through traffic over, you know, 400 miles. I mean, how does your approach change on a weekend like that when, you know, a wrench is kind of thrown in the plans? I mean, you just, you just got to do what you got to do. It is what it is. You know, we, we've, um, I think I qualified on the pole there back in 2009 and, uh, we ended up breaking a motor in final practice. So we ended up having to change the motor and going to the back of the field 
and started dead last and was able to come up through and win the race, you know. So this time around was way different situation where um, we had some body mods made where we were filling some areas of some Bondo with um, uh, the nose piece and where it connects to the front fenders. You know, you have to connect a metal piece of the car to a fiberglass piece of the car, and I guess they didn't like the way our Bondo was, so we had to keep changing that throughout the weekend to make them happy. And fortunately, Unfortunately, they uh, put us to the back for it, so we started dead last, and we just didn't have a very good car overall the whole weekend. You know, when we were in final practice, we were only 15th quick, and the car wasn't driving very good, and it kind of looked the same way in the race. We were only 15th quick in the race, and running around, uh, you know, 8th to 12th much of the day and kind of struggling along. And then uh, there towards the end, we had a late restart, and everybody just goes crazy on late restarts anyways. And uh, we got spun sideways on the front stretch, but was able to save it and keep it going straight. But uh, they docked us a couple spots for that. So uh, rough day, definitely just uh, not what we needed at all to, um, you know, to start our season. We're really far back, don't have a lot of points, and uh, it's not looking good right now. Yeah. Well, and I gotta, I gotta ask. So you say not looking good right now. We we got to talk about your championship last year and the championship in 2015. I mean, we, we got to compare those because if if anybody knows how to rally back and win a championship, it, I mean, it's you. I mean, compare your championship in 2015 to the one last year because both of them were hard fought, man. But uh, I mean, the one in 2015 that that was the one that wasn't supposed to happen, right? And uh, now <laughs> and you were end up crown champion. I mean, you know, compare those, and I mean, you know, and uh, how hard is it to win a championship? I mean, either which way you cut it, it's it's definitely tough at the cup level, man. Oh, uh, it's hard. It's hard to win races, let alone try to win a championship. But uh, you know, 2015, we uh, I got injured before the season even started. Really, wasn't able to make the Daytona 500, and then had to miss the first 11 races of the season. Um, was able to come back. I broke my right leg and my left foot, and had to go through rehab and, and rehabilitation stuff like that in order to get that stuff back going and working right and getting ready to get back in the car. Fortunately, I was able to do that. Um, you know, all actually side note, all while my wife was pregnant with our first son, Brexton, he, he was born, um, you know, two days after I got back in the race car for the first time at Charlotte. And, um, you know, the first couple of races didn't quite go very well, but then, uh, I think it was the fifth race at Sonoma. I didn't, I didn't think I was ever going to make it through the race at Sonoma. And fortunately here we are, we, we ended up winning the thing. And, um, we were able to, uh, start our, our surge of being able to win some races. We won three in a row right there, got ourselves in a, in a good spot points wise for, um, you know, making the top 30 in points before the, the playoffs started. So that gave us eligibility to be in the playoffs. And then we made it through each round of the playoffs and to Homestead and, and we won the thing, you know, so, um, it was kind of weird. We went through a dry spell though, from Indy, which was. I guess August uh, all the way through to Homestead. So people kind of discounted us not really having a shot for the championship. And same exact thing happened last year in 19, where our last race win for the regular season was uh, late June or something like that. And we didn't win again through the, the summer and, and fall stretch until we got all the way to Homestead and we were able to capitalize there and win again. So people kind of discredited us that we weren't going to be capable enough of winning a championship, but um, you know what? We, we showed up when it mattered most and uh, we did what we needed to do. So just real proud of the effort that um, my team has done. I've had Adam Stevens on board since 2015 and, um, you know, we've won two championships together. We've won 40 something races together. So it's been pretty awesome. Hopefully we can uh, keep that, that role going. We just got to get back on track here this year. And we'll be back with more with Kyle Bush after this here on the gentle tire down and dirty show powered by Polaris razor. I'm Polaris rider Jim Beaver. I race trophy trucks professionally, host a down and dirty radio show, and also travel the country announcing motorsports events. I've seen it all, and trust me, I've done most of it. So when it comes time to relax on the weekend, nothing is better than taking time with my family in our Razor vehicles. They've got the reliability I need to just pick up and go explore the desert dunes or trail and have the capability to attack even the harshest terrain. If you're looking for some of the most reliable and safest and hands-down most capable off-road machines in the world, look no further than 
and Polaris in their award-winning lineup of Razor vehicles. Whether you want your daughter to experience off-road driving for the first time in a Razor 170 like me, take the entire family out in a Razor XP4 1000 on the weekend, or shred the desert and dunes in the all-new Razor XP 1000 Fox Edition, Polaris has you handled. Take my advice and join me and some of the best drivers in the world by driving a Polaris Razor. Check out the full Polaris Razor lineup at Polaris.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.